Good morning, good morning. Welcome again to our Wednesday Bible study. We thank you so much for tuning in. And as always, we're asking if you would be so kind that you would share these lessons with all of your friends and acquaintances. Let them know there is a, a place where you can learn a little bit more about the Word of God. It's not a long lesson. You can listen to it while you're doing your daily thing, driving in the car, doing your chores or whatever. But we pray that you would help us to spread the word of God by sharing these lessons with those on your list. Right now, we're in our series on the life of King David, the greatest king in Israel's history. Now, David's reign was filled with bravery, intrigue, scandal, murder, betrayal, mercy, desertion and deliverance. But one, the one constant in all his troubles and triumphs was God. The life of David is to be viewed not only as entertainment, but also as enlightenment and encouragement. Now this study is designed to see just who this David fellow is and what process made him a man after God's own heart. We've seen the product, but let's look at the process and see if perhaps <clears throat> it might apply to us. First, we've seen a look into the heart. When Samuel was sent by God to the house of Jesse to anoint the next king in Israel, Jesse sent his oldest son and his next son and his next son, and Samuel thought, surely, these are the ones that God has chosen to be king in Israel, but God looked on the heart and man looked at the outward appearance. Anybody ever been guilty of that? Secondly, we saw David as the giant killer in 1 Samuel chapter 17. It was then we saw the courage and faith in God's next king of Israel. God had already shown David who he was. And David said, I can defeat Goliath because it's the battle belongs to God. Next, we saw in the next chapter, envy and its associates. In that lesson, we saw very vividly that envy does not travel alone. It brings with it many unsavory associates. So you need to be careful when envy invades your heart because it will bring a lot more with it. It won't just sit there by itself. It'll bring some of its associates. This, sir, this lesson in 1 Samuel chapter 19, God is my refuge. And I want you to see what, what David faces, the trial he has to endure, and how God became his refuge. 1 Samuel chapter 19, uh, starting at verse 1. And Saul spake to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning and abide in a secret place and hide thyself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art. And I will commune with my father of thee 
and what I see that I will tell thee. And Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul, his father, and said unto him, let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee. And because his works have been to thee word very good. For he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine. And Jehovah wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it and didst rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swear, as Jehovah liveth, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all those things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter. And they fled from him. <clears throat> and the evil spirit from Jehovah was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, and David played with his hand. And Saul sought to smite David, even to the wall with the javelin. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Now remember, Saul had tried to do this two previous times. This is the third time Saul decided he was going to kill David, but David escaped. Verse 11. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. Remember, David's wife, Michal, is Saul's daughter. And Saul thought he would make his daughter a snare unto David. He thought that if it came down to be between him and David, that she would choose him. Look at verse number 12. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michal took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth. And when, when Saul sent messengers to take David, he, she said, he is sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David saying, bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. And when the messengers would come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. And Saul said unto Michal, why hast thou deceived me so and sent away my enemy that he is escaped? And Michal answered Saul, he said unto me, let me go. Why should I kill thee? So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. And it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Naoth in Ramah. And Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was on the, upon the messengers of Saul. And they also prophesied. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. Look at what's going on here. Every time Saul sends some murderers after David, God intervenes, and the Spirit of God causes them to prophesy. Verse 22. Then went he also to Ramah. And came to a great well that is in Seku. And he asked and said, Where is Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they be at Naoth in Ramah. And he went thither to Naoth in Ramah, and the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. And he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore they say it's all also among the prophets. Look at the deliverance of David from God in this situation where he's being 
unjustly pursued. David doesn't have to fight Saul. God is fighting his battle. Saul now makes public his desire to kill David and includes Jonathan in, this, in the discussion. He's telling Jonathan and all of his servants he's going to kill David. Jonathan shows wisdom in the way he handled the situation. David, you had, and I'll talk to my dad and I'll let you know what he said. Remember, Jonathan loved David like a brother. He loved him so much that after he killed the giant, remember in chapter 17 that Jonathan gave him his robe and gave him his bow and gave him his weapons because he loved him so much. Now, we can avoid acting unwisely in the heat of the moment by being led by the spirit and not being led by the flesh. David's a mighty warrior. He's not afraid of Saul, but he knows that Saul is God's anointed. So he refuses to fight Saul. Saul could fight him, but he couldn't fight Saul. So now, Jonathan talks to his father, said, look, dad, David hadn't done anything to you. All he's done was behave in a wise manner and everything he did to you toward you was good. He took his life in his hand and slew that Philistine and you saw it and you rejoiced. So why are you about to kill innocent blood? Saul said, you're right. David's going to live. We saw how long that lasted, right? Now that Saul is calm, David is welcomed back as before. Till we get to verse number 10. David wins a great victory in battle and this reawakens the envy in the king. The evil spirit returned. David plays. It has no effect. And Saul tries to kill him again. Just because you got over it once, don't mean it won't return. Now, we've got to wonder, how can we guard against the return of envy and its associates? Remember, just because you got over something once doesn't mean that Satan won't always try to keep bringing it up and bringing it up and bringing it up and try to excite you into doing something ungodly. We've got to remember that in order to do what God wants, We've got to be led by the Spirit of God. So now Saul wants to kill David again. Now Saul sends servants to David's house to watch him and kill him in the morning. That always puzzled me. Why not kill him that night? But he sent servants to watch him. Now his wife, McCall, helps him escape through a window and makes up his bed with a dummy as if he is asleep. When questioned by Saul, she lied about what really happened. She told him that David threatened her life if she didn't let him go. But the reality was she loved David and didn't want her father to kill him. David goes to find Samuel, who is now presiding over a school of prophets. And Saul finds out where he is. He sends messengers three times to fetch him, but they are overcome by a spirit from God and begin to prophesy. So finally, he decides, I'm going myself. And he's also overcome the same way to the point that he strips off his clothes and lays naked on the ground. God wants to deliver David, but does not appear to want to kill Saul. So he thwarts his efforts by sending his spirit to overcome them. I suspect that if we think about it, there's a time when God delivered us in a way that we never imagined or what could be called an unusual way. And it also helps me to understand that my problem does not always have to be eliminated before I can see the deliverance of God. He's my refuge even when the problem continues to pursue me. Now we've seen in this chapter what happened to David. We saw the details of the event, the, the episode unfolded before our eyes. But in Psalm 59, we can read what was going through David's mind throughout this whole episode. The heading 
on that psalm is to the chief musician, Al Tashith, Mitchum of David, when Saul sent and they watched the house to kill him. So now when you read Psalm 59 and you read that caption, you'll understand that he's referring to what happened with David in 1 Samuel chapter 19. Psalm 59 reads, Deliver me from mine enemies, O God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloody men. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves without my fault. Awake to help me and behold. Thou therefore, O Jehovah, God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors, Selah. They return at evening. They make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. Behold, they belch out with their mouths. Swords are in their lips. For who, say they, doth hear? But thou, O Jehovah, shall laugh at them. Thou shalt have all the heathen in derision. Because of his strength will I wait upon thee. For God is my defense. The God of my mercy shall prevent me. God shall let me see my desire upon my enemies. Slay them not, lest my people forget. Scatter them by thy power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride. And for cursing and lying, which they speak. Consume them in wrath. Consume them that they may not be. And let them know that God ruleth in Jacob unto the ends of the earth, Selah. And at Eden, let them return and let them make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. Let them wander up and down for meat and grudge if they be not satisfied. But I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. For thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing. For God is my defense and the God of my mercy. I love this. In this prayer, to God for deliverance, David knows even before the prayer is answered who it is that got the victory. The mighty warrior knew that it was not by might of man that he was delivered, but by the power of God. So he promises to sing of God's power and sing of his mercy because God is his defense. David's prayer is one of confidence. He believes that God will deliver him from Saul as he had from the lion and the bear and the giant and in battle after battle. That's why I advocate all the time that we need to remember God's deliverance in times past because that will help us to rely on God's deliverance in the present. Listen to what Paul writes in Hebrews chapter 13, verses five and six. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. This, this psalm allows us to look into the emotions of David. We, we see what's happening on the outside, but this tells us what's happening on the inside. This psalm also reveals a bit about the process of making David Israel's greatest king. We see an unwavering faith in God is being built in David. And so we need to remember this lesson because God was David's refuge. And in times of trouble, 
he can be our refuge as well. I thank you so much for tuning in. Once again, we pray that you have been edified by a better understanding of what the Bible actually says. I hope you're getting a peek through the window into the life of the great King David and seeing the process that made him a man after God's own heart. Share this lesson with your friends and acquaintances and let them know what the Bible really says. Until the next time, we pray as always, you be careful and be prayerful. God bless you. Lord, I'm your child, Lord, and I need you.